I'm Dave Franzen, Professor of Soil Science and NDSU Extension Specialist at North Dakota State University, and this presentation is on our movement away from yield-based formulas and the logic and science behind it. The presentation is End of Yield-Based Fertilizer Recommendations and the, North, the End Calculators. So uh, the question on some people's mind is that the former nitrogen recommendations were yield-based, and the formulas were pretty straightforward. The wheat one was 2.5 times yield goal, less credits like nitrate to two feet and previous crop credits. And then corn was, for ages, decades, was 1.2 times yield goal, less the credits. And for sunflowers, for 30, 40 years, it's been 0 0.05 times yield goal in pounds per acre. And that was the formula. So why in the world would we want to get rid of that? Another thing that is really hard about this movement is that that there's a psyche within farmers. They've been taught since their earlier days that nitrogen recommendations are based on yield goals. And, and, I, and I think maybe sometimes as I'm talking to growers that that maybe the first or second story that their parents told them when they were very small went something like this. Once upon a time there were three little pigs and one day they were out in the field thinking about yield goals and then the story goes on from there. So that's how deeply embedded these formulas are in some people's mind. These are some concerns uh, that I had even before we established these new recommendations and had the data set to support it, is that having a formula like that of a some number times the yield goal makes farmers think that they can push the yield higher by using a higher end rate that two and a half pounds of nitrogen equals one more bushel of wheat, that 1.2 pounds more N equals one more bushel of corn, and that a twentieth of a pound of nitrogen equals one more pound of sunflower seed, and and that zero N equals zero yield, and really that's, that's not true. So what the formulas show is a, is a linear relationship you know, the 2.5 to 1 relationship or 1.2 to 1 relationship. So it kind of looks like this, that the yield goes through 0, 0 on the left-hand side there, and then at some point, uh, your magic yield goal, your Christmas wish, your, your hope for the future, uh, that's when it plateaus out and no nitrogen apparently doesn't make any more yield. And, and this is really just a fantasy. So this is what real data looks like. This is all the data we accumulated. The data that went into the wheat set, well over 100 site years of data, uh, modern data, and data that had yields that are pretty comparable to the yields we had today. That's what's in the set. And over on the left we have the wheat yield, and on the bottom we'll have the available end. That's a total available end that includes the the soil test nitrate to two feet for pre previous crop credits if we if we know what they are so the the real relationship is that curve black line that goes through the middle of the quadratic curve the the kind of relationship that we always see with soil fertility research and the yellow line which goes through zero zero and then up toward the top is the wheat line the 2.5 times yield goal and it it's not really related to the data at all doesn't doesn't explain anything about what's going on. Protein also, which we is an economic importance to farmers of spring wheat Durham, is also a quadratic curve and not a straight line. One of the things we do with all of our work with the wheat and the corn and the and the sunflower, the three crops that we worked with the last what, eight, nine, ten years, something like that, to uh, modernize our recommendations to make them compatible with site-specific agriculture is, is take a look at the data without consideration for the soil test. And there's a few sites in there also that have maybe soybeans or field peas or something as a previous crop, and that's not considered in this data too. So, so this is what that data looks like. There's a little bit of a relationship there. 
But I want to call your attention to the very left side where no nitrogen is applied. And yields go from around 6 bushels an acre to 83. And if you can explain how that's possible with no N, I would love to visit with you because it doesn't make any sense at all. Data only makes sense if you put the soil test in with it. So let's go back to the end of yield-based formulas. The first research group that looked at data and decided that there really wasn't any relationship between nitrogen and uh, something like expected yield and that nitrogen was independent between sites but, but dependent within site was the group at Oklahoma State, Bill Ron, Brian Arnell, uh, and they they started tweaking this out uh, somewhere around uh, the late 1990s, 2000, when they were working on the Green Seeker. They were the developers of the Green Seeker, and they were the uh, agronomy portion of the development of the Green Seeker. And they they found that if they if they tried to use the same algorithms with something like an expected yield, it just didn't work. That yield and nitrogen rate were independent between fields, and so that's the reason that in our algorithms that we have the nitrogen-rich strip always in the field is because you have to have an in-field reference for adequate nitrogen that some formula describing everything uh, doesn't really work. Starting around 2005, the Midwest Corn Belt states uh, started working and recommending nitrogen rates for corn based on a return to nitrogen economic production function. And we have used that now since 2010 and all of our all of our modern recommendations for nitrogen are not only responsive yield and and maybe quality uh, in the case of spring wheat durum to nitrogen rate but but also the economic cost of that. And those recommendations don't have yield in them at all either. And so it's implied by by Wisconsin and Illinois and Indiana and all the other states that, that use the return to nitrogen model uh, is that they recognize that, that yield and nitrogen rate are independent between fields and the recommendations are not yield goal based. So the first people that came out with that idea that returned the nitrogen model were John Sawyer from Iowa State and Emer Emerson Nafziger at Illinois, my counterparts in those states. And uh, that model integrates yield response to N with economics, and the recommendations aren't yield goal. It assumes the grower is going for as much yield as economically practical. I have no idea why a grower would want to shoot for a 100 bushel an acre of corn in uh, eastern North Dakota doesn't make any sense to me. And so why not make recommendations that assume that they're going for as much as they can get? In certain states, there are areas within the states that where the yield response is different than in other parts of the state. And in those states, they, they separate those areas out. And we do the same thing with ours, as you'll see as we go forward. So what does all this mean? So with the, this, this is the background of all of our return to nitrogen recommendations and the ones from Iowa and Illinois. So the, the factor that affects the rate of nitrogen the most is the, the price that the growers will get for the commodity, in this case corn, but the same principle also is used in our wheat recommendations and sunflower recommendations. So we have down here at the bottom an, an array of end rate curves with $3 corn, and the middle one is $4 corn, and the top one is $5 corn. So that array is made up of the cost of nitrogen within those data sets. And the peak of the curve, here we have $5 corn, and the top curve is always the low end rate in this, um, or end cost. Uh, and, and in this uh, suite of choices, this is $0.20 cent end, $0.30, cent, $0.40, cent, $0.50, cent, up to a 
a dollar a pound for nitrogen. And, and all of these nitrogen costs are, are costs that I've seen in the last 25 years. So these are all real costs. So the rate that's recommended at a cost of corn uh, depends on the price of the nitrogen, and it's the very peak of this curve, which you can determine with a, well, a couple of rulers, but most easily, since we have the formula for this, we just we figured out mathematically what the what the maximum is here. You can do it with calculus. It's one of the reasons why I took it. So, so all of these numbers uh, here that would equate to a, a a nitrogen number down here at the bottom. So it's all the poor, and you can. Hope you appreciate that when you get down here to three dollar corn, when you start talking about uh, nitrogen costs that are seventy cents, eighty, ninety cents, a dollar a pound, that uh, the best choice is not to put any nitrogen on at all, which is uh, makes people gasp. But but economically, farmers need to understand that the reason they put on fertilizer is to is to increase their profit, and if they're if they're not profitable doing it, then why in the world are they doing it? It's not an exercise; it's an economic decision. We came out with nitrogen uh, calculators web-based for wheat first and then for corn. And then in January 2015, we were about ready to, to really start getting down. Uh, the field work had been done on our sunflower work. And my graduate student, Eric Schultz, was given a presentation at the 2016 soil and soil water workshop which i put on uh, at the dome and then one of the front rows was a old colleague of mine uh, a good friend and um, uh, esteemed person who was the head agriculturist of american crystal sugar al katna and al was looking through eric's presentation and there were a lot of graphs that kind of looked like this that that there were there was a relationship between the data and the curve but the relationship was pretty weak. This number here is going to come up a lot, this R squared. This R squared is the statistical relationship between the scatter of points and the curve or the line that describes it. In R squared of 1.0, which we never see in ag work, is perfect, uh, perfect correlation, per perfect relationship. If we had a R squared of of 1.0, all we would see would be that line, because all of the all of the points that were generated from that research would fall directly on that line. And then an R squared of zero would be there would be no relationship at all. We wouldn't be able to place a line there at all. And this is pretty close to it, isn't it? And you know, it looks better when we start dividing it out by by uh, soil. But uh, but this is what it looks like, and so so Dr. Katnar raised his hand and and he said he'd just be really reluctant to make a recommendation for nitrogen based on data with an R squared that low. And I started thinking about his comment, and it bothered me because I knew that in almost every site that that we had the data. For each individual site, the R squared, the relationship between the data and yield was very strong. I mean, R squares of, I don't know, 0 0.5, 0 0.8, something like that sometimes. So it was it was really strong. But but when you graphed it all on one graph, it just looked like this cloud. And so there was a disconnect there and a failure of what we were doing at that time to describe what was actually going on between sites. And so I started thinking about why in the world that relationship of available nitrogen to yield was so diffuse when the relationships within the sites were so highly related. And so I started thinking about it like this, and I'd like for you to think about it as well as we go through here, and I'm going to try to convince you that what I'm, that uh, this line of thinking is, is correct. So when we combine all the sites, it kind of looks like that where we have this diffuse cloud, and uh, you can you can force a curve through it, but the R squared is going to be very low. The, the statistis statistical relationship of the raw data with nitrogen is going to be very low. But really what we're looking at is something like that, where we have 
a series of almost parallel quadratic curves stacked on top of each other from low yielding environments to the highest yielding environments. In each individual site, the relationship is high, but graphing the raw yield makes it look really poor. This idea came to mind because it's something we use in site-specific agriculture. I, I strongly discourage farmers and their consultants from using a one-year yield map to help make zones uh, for management, site-specific nutrient management specifically of the field. I, what I'd rather see them do is to take multiple years of yield maps and then combine them together. But some years the yields, even if you're using the same, same crop, let's say that you're irrigating down at Oaks and you have corn every year, but, but one year the corn, the, the top yield is 250 and the next year it's 200 and maybe you have a really poor year and it's 180 and then you have things in the middle. So how in the world do you put those things together and, and have it make sense? And, and then a lot of people, of course, just don't grow one crop, uh, at least they shouldn't most of the time. And so uh, there'll be maybe three or four crops in a rotation, and some, like, uh, say, sunflowers, are going to be in pounds an acre, and others are going to be in bushels an acre. And even if you translated the corn into pounds an acre, it's certainly going to be much higher than something like a canola crop or a sunflower crop or a soybean crop. And they, they all have have different pounds and acres that you take out of the soil. And so how do you do that? Well, you do it by normalization, and this is what I mean. Here's an example from our sunflower data. So we had a site that had a high yield uh, within the data set of, really it was over 4,000, but we'll just put 4,000 here, for example. And so what we do to normalize the data and get it in the same range of values as all the other fields is divide all of the yields in the data set by the highest yield here 4,000 pounds and when we get done we have values between 0 and 1 and then we have a site that for whatever reason it had a high yield within the plot of 1800 pounds so we divide all the yields by 1800 and again we end up with values between 0 and 1 and we have a sunflower site that has yields in the middle 2500 pounds and we divide all the yields by 2,500, so again, we end up with values between 0 and 1. So it doesn't matter what the high yield was within one of the data sets that you're being, that, that's being put together. At the end, they all have values between 0 and 1. So that's what we do when we normalize. So if nitrogen rate is independent of site, and independent of expected yield, then normalizing the yields at all of our sites is going to end up looking like that, with the data collapsing upon the response curve. And so it would look like that instead of that diffuse cloud we looked at before. If I'm wrong, and sites are important, and the expected yield is important, then the data is going to look like this. Like here's the low yielding site, and when you increase down, it's going to go up like this. And here's the highest yielding site. And, the, and so it's going to still look like a cloud when we get done. It's not going to help it. So that's what would happen if after it was normalized if what I said is not true. So let's take a look at our data for all our crops and see whether the sites are independent of yield or independent of nitrogen rate or not. So here are... Western North Dakota, the West River fields mostly uh, conventional till wheat sites and the raw yield up in the upper left-hand corner. And we can uh, scribe a quadratic curve, and the R squared is low, but it's still significant. Uh, but the cloud is pretty diffuse, isn't it? So what happens when we normalize the data? The right-hand graph shows, shows that. When we normalize the data, the R squared, the relationship, more than triples up to 0.53. The data is collapsing around the curve and is m much more strongly related. So Western North, North Dakota no-till wheat sites, the raw yields, again pretty low R squared, 0.19. And again when we normalize them in the in the right hand figure, the R squared again more than triples up to 0.62. It's collapsing around the curve.
How about eastern North Dakota wheat sites? Uh, conventional till. R squared a little bit better, 0.31. Still pretty diffuse, but when we normalize them, uh, they almost double up to 0.58. So again, they're collapsing around that curve. And the no-till wheat sites in the eastern North Dakota, uh, we start out with 0.26 in the raw yields. And when we normalize them, again, the R-squared increases. Not quite double, but uh, certainly it's a, a lot better relationship than what we had before. So let's, let's look at corn. Here's the eastern North Dakota high clay conventional till sites in the upper left, the raw yields, and the R-square is 0.22, which is fairly low. And then when we normalize those sites, the R-square goes up to 0.47, more than doubles. And if we look at the eastern no-till sites with corn, raw yields R-square to 0.2. And when we normalize that data, the R-square goes up to 0.68, more than triples. And how about sunflowers? Western North Dakota no-till sunflower sites, raw yields 0.27, pretty diffuse. And when we normalize the data, they collapse around a curve and our square goes up to 0.47. And how about the conventional sites in eastern North Dakota? Raw yields really low R squared to 0.14. And when we normalize those same sites, the R squared about triples up to 0.41. So the only reason that can happen is that normalizing and the increase in the R-squared are telling us that the data is really what I thought it was, a series of reasonably parallel quadratic curves. They lay right on top of each other depending on the productivity of the site. And so these data that you just saw, they indicate that the use of yield-based nitrogen rate formulas should end and people should recognize that a profitable end rate in a low yielding environment is similar to the end rate that should be used in a higher yielding environment. So this is uh, hard for people to wrap their heads around. How can this be possible? How can the same end rate that's going to give you the highest yield slash profit in a low yielding environment be the same end rate that's going to give you high yield and profit in a high yielding environment. So let me try to explain what I think is happening that makes this happen. In a low yielding environment in North Dakota, it's usually low yielding because of water. Either it's too dry or it's excessively wet. We have these situations in the state almost every year someplace. Sometimes we, oftentimes we have both. So in a dry yielding environment, a dry low yielding environment, let's let me let me try to explain what's happening there. Nitrogen rate is not the only source of nitrogen that a crop sees. Generally the nitrogen use efficiency of any nitrogen we apply to a, as a fertilizer is especially pre-plant or at planting is around 30%. I know that's a shock cuz people think it all goes into the crop. But it really doesn't. I mean, in a conventional till system, about 30% goes into the crop, and the rest comes from someplace else. Well, what's someplace else? One of the sources of nitrogen for the crop is the mineralization, the decomposition of organic matter and residues, and the release of nitrogen when that organic material rots. When you were in a dry environment, the microbes that make that work aren't very active. They're largely dormant. And so in a dry year, the amount of nitrogen we get from mineralization is very low. Also, the main mechanism for nitrogen to move to a plant root is through what we call mass flow. Nitrate is soluble, and when there is soil water, that soil water moves toward the plant because the plant is a pump and it's pumping water starting at the roots and then up through the leaves through the evaporation we call it transpiration through the leaves and so it's pumping out and so there's a potential difference between the roots and the soil and that uh, vacuum if you want to think about it like that near the roots draws the water that's in the soil toward the plant root, including the nitrate that's dissolved within it. 
That's mass flow. Well, if the soil's real dry, how much mass flow do you get? Like none. And so that means that the that the nitrogen use efficiency of anything that you've applied is much lower in a dry year than it is in something we would consider normal. So let's take a look at at uh, what happens when it's wet. When it's when it's wet and the soil pores at the surface and near the surface are pretty well filled with water, those microbes don't work that well in that situation also. In addition, we experience nitrogen losses. If it's a loamy, sandier soil, uh, then we get leaching losses below the rooting zone. And if it's high clay soils, especially in the eastern North Dakota, but in rare occasions out west, we get a process called denitrification, where when the soil pores are are full of water, which is easy to do in a clay soil because their pores are so small, that there are there are microbes that take nitrate and transform them to nitrogen gas and nitrous oxide, and once that happens, they're completely gone for any kind of use by the plant. So we have nitrogen losses. We have low mineralization from the soil when the soil is really wet like that. Certainly there is mass flow, but the problem with the roots is is that usually in a real wet year, which the wetness normally happens somewhere in the May through mid-June area, sometimes longer than that, is that uh, the root systems are pretty shallow. A lot of farmers have seen that, consultants have taken the time to dig out plants. And so even if it dries up, the the amount of root volume that those roots explore is greatly reduced compared to what they can do during what we might consider a normal year. So the end result of a dry environment or an excessively wet environment is that it takes more nitrogen per unit yield, bushels or pounds, than it would in what we would consider a normal water year. Well, this is the winter of 2017, and this is a great time to talk about high-yielding environment, except for the poor people up in northeast uh, North Dakota that experienced a deluge uh, this past year. The rest of the state, the moisture was near ideal. It wasn't too wet. It wasn't too dry. We had outstanding yields in many places in the state. I had nitrogen studies on wheat where the check plots went 70 bushels and the protein wasn't that bad. I had had check plots with low residual N on corn studies that went 180 bushels with no no application of N. It was, I've never seen mineralization and release of nitrogen from the soil at that high rate ever in my entire career here and anywhere else. So when the moisture is near ideal, not too wet, not too dry, no, not extreme in temperature, and certainly we didn't have the extremes this year that we do some years, the mineralization is at its peak. M my guess is in a, in a lot of the state outside of northeast North Dakota, that rates of N mineralization were 100, 150 pounds of N per acre. Just unbelievable. So that happens. And it certainly supports higher yield, doesn't it? The other thing that happens is that there's enough moisture in the soil to support that mass flow. That when the when the roots uh, take up water, and it's uh, lost through the through the leaves, that that potential difference between the low water potential and the in the uh, near the roots and the higher water content in the soil that there's a movement of water toward the roots with the nitrate, and so the efficiency of any nitrogen that's in the soil is very high. In addition, uh, there's no water logging or dryness in the soil that's going to restrict the root ball, so the roots explore the maximum volume of soil possible. So release of N from the soil is very high. The efficiency of any nitrogen that's available is very high. So the net result is it takes far less nitrogen per bushel or pound or unit of yield to grow a crop than it does in, the nor in what we consider a normal year. The net result of that, apparently, based on our data, is that the same rate of nitrogen to produce economic maximum yields in a low-yielding environment is the same rate that's necessary 
to produce economic maximum yields in a in an ideal high yielding environment. So all of our new fertilizer recommendations are not going to be yield-based formulas. The recommendations are going to be relative yield-based. And whenever possible, there's going to be regional and soil differences that result in different relationships between nutrient and yield. And these are going to be incorporated and have been incorporated into our recommendations, all of our modern recommendations. So we're moving on to the nitrogen calculators. And we've divided the state up into these three zones uh, so far. And the biggest divide is between eastern North Dakota and western North Dakota. The differences between these two areas, I hope, is intuitive, that it tends to be more moist in the east, and it tends to be a drier environment in most years in the west. Also, the soils in the east are sediments that are 10,000 years old or less, and the sediments in western North Dakota are what we call residuum. Uh, there are sediments from the rocks in place, and a lot of those sediments are 65 million years old. So the, there's differences between those two environments. I get questions from time to time for people that uh, are in, say, um, you know, Emmons County, Burley County, uh, Minot, you know, and, and uh, Minot, uh, especially because that line kind of goes right through the middle of Minot. So how in the world, if you're in that fuzzy area, how do you decide if you're in the east and the west? And I would suggest that you take a look at your county soil survey and where your fields are. And there are, there are two different soils that occur in eastern North Dakota and western North Dakota on the same landscape and in a hilltop and a slope environment in the eastern North Dakota the hilltops often are characterized or named uh, abuse soil B-U-S-E and the side slopes a lot of them are barns soils B-A-R-N-E-S just like the county and those same landscapes hilltop slopes in western North Dakota they have different soil series that describe them on the hilltops, you'll have a Zal, Z-A-H-L, and on the side slopes, you'll have Williams, like the county. And so if you look in your, say, Ward County Soil Survey, and you look at those soils on your soil survey, and you see a lot of abuse barns, then you're, on, you're in eastern North Dakota, because what's, ha what's, what's happening is that soil survey is telling you what the, nor what the environment, what the predominant environment has been, climate-wise, for about the past thousand years. And if you see in your ward soil so survey that your soils in that area are dominated by Zoll Williams, then that's, that soil survey is telling you that for the past thousand years, you've been in more of a western North Dakota environment. So that's how I'd handle it, is look at the soil survey. So then we have that unusual Langdon area up there. And the reason why it's unusual is, number one, because from the very beginning, the data from the Langdon area told us it was different. And the second reason, the reason it's different, and the reason the data is different, is that there's a lot of ground-up shale in those soils. It's almost impossible to take a soil probe out there, put it into the ground, and take it out, and not see these little slivers of of gray, flat, um, stratified rock in it. That's shale. That soil is shallow to shale in that area. It's mixed up in the soil, and that shale contains high amounts of mineralizable ammonium within the shale. So the reason that the end rates are lower up there is that that soil acts like a slow-release fertilizer just naturally. So we have three regions. So Going to the North Dakota Wheat Nitrogen Calculator, again, first thing we see when we pull up the web base calculator is the three, the three areas. And then if you're uh, maybe in Steele County, you put Eastern North Dakota, and automatically it goes low productivity is defined as historic yields below 40 bushels, medium from 41 to 60, and high productivity over 60. 
So I've just told you that these aren't yield-based, but the first thing we're doing is taking a look at historic yields. Why am I doing that? Well, wheat's a little bit different than corn and sunflowers. Corn and sunflowers are usually going to be, especially corn, is going to be on the best soil uh, within a farm. It's not going to be on the poorer stuff. And so wheat is kind of a crop that gets placed when you fit the rest of the puzzle together. You say, well, what are we going to do about Hannah's farm? I mean, it's always kind of a tough farm. I don't really want, don't want to put corn or soybeans there. What do I do? Oh, we'll just put wheat on it. So there are some fields in the state that uh, farmers are really happy when it hits 30, 35 bushels because some years it doesn't hit anything close to that. And I think wheat is really our only crop where we have that great range of historical yields because you'll put wheat anywhere where you'll be more selective where you put some other crops. So the productivity is in there for economic reasons, not because of the response of the crop to nitrogen. So you choose the, the, the productivity, and then you can choose the previous crop that you plant. And if uh, it's an annual legume, or if it's a sugar beet uh, with different color leaves, or if you're taking out alfalfa and putting it down, so you, you click on those. So those are important. Then over here on the left, we select the wheat price, toggle up and down, uh, select the nearest nitrogen cost, you toggle up and down, gives you kind of a preview. You put in the soil test nitrate to two feet, and uh, then up here you put in whether the field is conventionally tilled, or if you've been in no-till from one to five years, or if the field is long-term continuous no-till, then you would click that one. Put in the organic matter, but that really doesn't change anything until you get to 6%. The organic matter is going into the general productivity of the soil and being swallowed up on that. Probably part of the reason why we see that high yielding sites uh, don't need any more nitrogen because the organic matter is, is putting that in. It's unusual to have a field or part of a field that has an organic matter of 1% being a really high yielding field. So but it's uh, more common for a high part of a field to be higher organic matter, doesn't it? So that's probably another part of the reason why we don't have yield differences. Nitrogen rate differences between differences in yield within fields and between fields. So when we get to the end, we have the nitrogen recommendation, and we have a plus and minus 30 pounds there because I don't know everything about a grower's farm. Uh, these These come from over 100 sites of of data for the corn and the and the wheat, uh, the thirty some sites with the sunflower. So there are many fields I don't know anything about. So I rely on the growers and their consultants to have some common sense, and this is the point where we exercise it. And if they need it, they have our professional license to increase it or decrease it based on with wheat, especially uh, say protein. There are some varieties that'll give you fourteen percent protein. Uh, almost every time. And then there's some varieties, usually the really high yielding varieties, but not necessarily, that struggle to hit that 14%, and they may need that extra N. So that's why that plus, plus or minus. So I kind of skipped over that, uh, that no-till. Why do we put that in there? That comes from a conversation I had with the original long-term no-till people in the state, back in, it was either the winter of 95, pretty sure it was, at the Manitoba, North Dakota Zero-Till Conference, and all the original no-tillers, the Beach Boys, uh, you know, people from South Central North Dakota and Northwest North Dakota, people have been no-tilling at that time for well over 20 years. And they told me that they were happy to see me, but then they also told me that they didn't follow NDSU nitrogen recommendations anymore, and I asked them why, and they said that after they'd been in no-till for a series of years, they found they could start cutting their nitrogen rates, and they now had cut them to the point where the NDSU recommendations at 2.5 times yield goal didn't make any sense for them anymore. So in 2009, 
2010, when I was sitting down with that data set of over 100 sites, uh, I thought about that conversation, and I had sites, West River and East River, that that were long-term no-till, and there were some that were conventional till, and so I thought, well, I wonder. So I divided them up, and, and they were right. Uh, for example, uh, here, the conventional till, to hit 50 bushels, it takes somewhere around 150 pounds of N. To hit 150 bushels here in the or to hit 50 bushels in the in the no-till wheat, it takes 150 pounds of N or less. And the same with the protein. Uh, it took 50 pounds of N less N to produce equal or better, usually better, protein than conventional till. So we've looked at that in corn. We deliberately put out sites in long-term no-till fields in corn and when we went to sunflowers. And the same principle applies to each. In the wheat, we have a no-till credit that comes off the calculator with the corn and the sunflower. It's just a different recommendation curve. But the end point is, is that uh, long-term no-till is way more efficient in nitrogen use than conventional till. So why do I think this happens? There's some background evidence uh, of what I'm saying here. And it just makes sense to me. First thing people think of is, well, the long-term no-till has more organic matter. But that's not necessarily so. There's 5.5% organic matter soils in the valley, for example, that in a, in, a, in a year it only released maybe 30, 40 pounds of N per year. So it's not, it's not the organic matter that's pouring out nitrogen. What I think is happening is this. In both conventional till and, and long-term no-till, there are microbes that are in the soil. The microbes that are in conventional till have been selected for those organisms that, when residue is incorporated, they burn up the residue very fast. They decompose it very fast, and, and then they're just kind of gone. They're dormant until the next flush of residue comes. Nitrogen is as limiting to microbe growth and reproduction as it is to crops. So when we apply nitrogen to soil, some of it's being absorbed, taken up, if you will, by microorganisms, and some lingers in the soil and hopefully is there when the crops need it. So if you put nitrogen in conventional till, there, are, there is some biology there that's going to take up some nitrogen, but most of the nitrogen is going to change to nitrate within a couple, three weeks after application. It's just going to sit there as inorganic. And any bad thing that comes along, excessive water usually, is either going to result in leaching and loss below the root zone, or in the higher clay soils, it's going to result in the denitrification, the gaseous loss of nitrogen. In, but in no-till, there are, there are more organisms. There's a greater variety of organisms from little things to big things. And there are also many more of them. And so when we put on nitrogen in a long-term no-till system, there may be a little bit of free nitrate there. But a lot of that nitrogen, I think, is taken up by microorganisms, and that's important because microorganisms, the life cycle often is measured in days and weeks, and so there are organisms that continually die, they decay, they release the nitrates taken up by more microorganisms, or later on in the season, after about 30 days or so, then the crop has taken up significant amounts, and so it's able to utilize that. And that's one of the reasons, I think, why in the long-term no-till it's a lot easier to achieve a 14% protein in wheat than it is conventional till because the microorganisms seem to act like a slow-release fertilizer. So it's not that we don't get some leaching loss or some denitrification from long-term no-till, but the amount that we lose is far less in the same environment than a conventional till. So I think our nitrogen credit comes from just a higher efficiency of nitrogen use. If in conventional till we have, say, 30% nitrogen use efficiency and we're able to bump it up to, say, 50%, which I think is likely in a long-term no-till environment, that's certainly enough in order to, to create that 
or produce that nitrogen credit that we give long-term no-till because our data tells us that we need to do so. So this is our corn nitrogen calculator. We don't have a, something carved out for Langdon because there's not that much corn up there and we have no data. But I would suggest to people to do try to grow corn up there as the as our useful corn varieties, corn hybrids, become uh, what lower day and lower day, which is it tends to be happening. That uh, you consider a nitrogen credit for being up in the Langdon area too. So we click either West River or East River, and then we have the conventional uh, till, irrigated corn, no-till corn. They're separate separate uh, databases to support all of those. We're in conventional till in the east, then uh, we have uh, no-till for one to five years, but we also have, uh, do we have high clay soils with historic yields above 160 or less than 160, and then we have medium texture. What does that mean? High clay soil is anything of 35% clay or, or higher. Anything from, say, a Bearden soil uh, onward, uh, most of these soils are going to be Fargo's or Vikings or Hegney's or something like that. But anything from a Bearden upward, 35% clay or more. And then the medium clay soils is kind of a catch-all. So anything that's not medium or high clay is a medium textured soil, a silt loam, a loam, uh, sandy loam, loamy sands, they're all in that medium textured soil basket. We divide it out in the yields, and the reason for that is is that there are some soils that uh, have internal drainage that's good enough to support those really high yields without doing anything special as split application of N. But then we have fields that struggle because of their internal drainage, uh, particularly during wet years, and the, um, the yield struggle to get much above 120 bushels an acre. And the same with the medium textured soils. There's enough leaching in some of these wet years that it's a real struggle to hit 100 bushels an acre. So that's a cue for people that have those kind of soils to not just think about rate, but think about timing. Those are the soils that would probably benefit from a split application of nitrogen, a side dress nitrogen application. So then uh, the it's an economic production function, so we put in the nearest corn price, nearest nitrogen cost, the soil test to two feet, the organic matter in the soil, <coughs> previous crop credit over here, and the nitrogen recommendation, plus or minus 30 pounds an acre again, to take advantage of a grower common sense. Then the sunflower nitrogen calculator is the one that uh, is the newest. came out just uh, about a year and a half ago. We have a Langdon area up here because there are sunflowers growing up there, mostly convections. So it has a different uh, data set. Sunflower pricing, nitrogen cost, percent N, and uh, organic matter in the soil, the nitrate to two feet. And then the tillage. Conventional till, and then oil seed and conventional till, or convention, Confection sunflowers are different uh, response curves, long-term no-till again, and then the short-term no-till. So this is one nitrogen rate, this is uh, substantially lower, and this is a little bit higher rate than the conventional till because some of that nitrogen has been tied up into decomposition of residues until you hit that magic five, six years, seven year time period when the biology is in full swing previous crop credits, and then the nitrogen recommendations. So those are all available as a web-based nitrogen calculator. To get there, just search for Dave Franz and NDSU, source of all soil fertility information that you really need to know in this region. And in the upper right-hand corner, there's uh, three calculators, the corn, the wheat, and the sunflowers. So you can click on those go through them just like I, just like I uh, explained to you. But in this uh, world of everybody doing everything on phones, I was able to have my wonderful technician, Hong Gang Bu, program these uh, phone apps. So we have a phone app for Android, and we also have one for iPhones. So you can just go to the App Store for each of those phones and look up North Dakota Crop Nitrogen Calculator,
click on that and follow the instructions. It's free, download, and ready to go. So Yield Goal, rest in peace. There is no reason to have Yield Goal recommendations anymore and uh, use the nitrogen calculators. And I thank you for your attention.